Okay, good morning, everyone. Those of you who are joining us at home, I want to thank you for chiming in. Thank you if you are joining us on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. I got to be honest, when my kids were little, they would take our songbooks and Bibles and stuff that we would have, and they would go and they would play church by themselves, just two or three of them in the room. And so I kind of feel like I'm playing church with, with Jamie and, and Danny and Noah right now. Uh, it's just not the same with everybody not being in the building with us, but we do uh, want to thank you for joining us on this live stream, and we're just glad that everyone is home and staying safe. These are challenging times, and we're just grateful to have our church family with us at this time. We're going to begin just with a couple of announcements, and the first announcement, uh, announcement that I wanted to make to us all this morning is a big thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes to make these live streams possible, and I specifically want to say thank you to our Deacon of Technology, Dennis Inglis, and his wife, Rachel. They have worked tirelessly and put in uh, plenty of hours this past week to make sure that we as a church family can come together and worship, albeit through live stream, people scattered all over our area. But just a big thank you to them and a big thank you to our deacons who are taking a, a, a lion's share of the work, um, following up with people, reaching out and trying to meet needs, uh, trying to find out what's going on in the congregation. Just everybody has been chipping in and it's good to see, see that. And so a big thank you to everyone who has been contributing. We also want to offer up prayers and ask for prayers for all those who have been affected by this. Um, there's been many people that have been affected in many different ways, be it financially, uh, emotionally, spiritually. This is a challenging time, not just for us, but for people around the world. And so when we have a prayer in a little bit, we'll be praying about these things. We do have several of our members who are in need of prayer at this time. Those who are facing continued health difficulties, they're facing continued challenges. Our secretary sent out a, by email, a list of those people. And until we are able to come together again and put those announcements in the Sunday handout, I would ask you to look for that email and also check our Facebook page where you'll have an updated list of those that we need to be praying for. So make sure you look for those things and be praying and be diligent, diligent in prayer about those things at this time. Also want to just give you a reminder of how this streaming is going to work. Obviously, if you're joining us live right now, you've got it figured out how it's going to work. But we have two different ways that you can, you can log in. You can go to Facebook and join us there, or you can go to YouTube. But if you're not able to catch the live stream and you want to watch this after the fact, you can go to our church's main webpage and you can go to Messages up there at the top and where the sermons are posted, you'll have the ability to not only watch the uh, sermon as it was preached after the fact, but there's also a link to the PowerPoint presentation from that message. And the YouTube channel is going to archive our service and you'll be able to come back later if you're not able to join in in the live stream and go to our church's YouTube channel and follow up with that live stream service. Again, we do hope that this is just a temporary measure. We're doing the best that we can. We would love to have everybody come back together soon. But in the meantime, if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to call myself or call Dennis Inglis. Uh, just look our numbers up in the directory if you have to, or you can call down to the church office as long as we're able to have the office open and we'll help you out in that way. And I also want to remind everyone about uh, just a couple of things pertaining to worship. We have made portal, uh, disposable communion supplies available, and you can pick those up at the office. We do ask that you'll call Juanita ahead of time and pick up those communion supplies. Or we've made a recipe for communion bread available online. We also would like to ask you regarding the contribution to do a few things. Number one, uh, you can send the contribution check to our post office box, which is P.O. Box 1301 Hopewell, Virginia 23860. You could drop it off down here at the church building, or you could just hold on to it until hopefully we can come back together again soon uh, in the near future. Um, we're also working on trying to come up with a way where you can donate online, but we haven't secured that yet, but hopefully we will get that taken care of this week. 
And the last thing I wanted to emphasize is, is if there's any needs, you know, one of the challenges of this is when we come together as a congregation each Sunday, it allows us a, a chance to speak to one another and to check up on one another. And when we're scattered and, and staying in our homes, uh, there may be some needs. There may be some things that folks need that aren't being met. And so if you have any needs at all, if you need someone to run to the grocery store for you, if you uh, need someone to uh, reach out to you and, and help you in any way, make sure that you let us know. Feel free to contact us and reach out to us, and we'd be glad to help you in any way that we can. All right, at this time, we're going to begin our worship service. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Jacobs, who is going to be our song leader this morning. You should be able to see the slides in which we will be projecting the songs that Jamie will be leading. And I'm going to turn it over to Jamie at this time. For those of you in the room, the first number is 430. 430. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Our next song is number 538. After this, we will be led in an opening prayer. My Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He understands each lonely heartache. He understands because he cares. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. My Jesus knows when I am burdened. He knows how much my heart can bear. He lifts me up when I am sinking and brings me joy beyond compare. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. When other friends 
seem to forget me. When skies are dark, when hope is gone, by faith I feel his arms around me and hear him say, you're not alone. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. I have our opening prayer next. Let us pray for the opening prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, for all the blessings that you have showered upon us. Thank you, Lord God, for your continued blessings, especially in these times of need. We are grateful, Lord God, that you are our God, who never forgets his children. We are grateful for your mercy and, and your son's great sacrifice on the cross for our sins. There are a lot of things that we should be thankful about, and there's a lot more things that we request for. But at this time, Father, we, we pray for, for strength and wisdom that we may be able to go through these hard times, that we may continue to, to seek your guidance and your wisdom and that we may continue to, to gather strength from you and help us, Lord God, to encourage one another, to lift one another, and just to seek out our brethren and see if they're doing okay. Help us, Lord God, to be an instrument of encouragement, not only to your children, but throughout the world. We pray, Lord God, for those who are affected of, of this uh, event, that they may continue to be strengthened, that they may continue to get well. Help us, Lord God, to remember that you are in control, and that we can rely on you in, in good times and times like this. We pray, Lord God, for those who are sick, those who are not able to go out. Help us, Lord God, to, to remember them in our prayers, that they may continue to get well. And help us, Lord God, to have a, a loving heart, a helping heart, that not only that we, we pray for them, but also, Lord God, to, to do something and help them out. We pray, Lord God, for, for all the churches in the world that experiencing this, this challenge. We pray, Lord God, that, and, re, and realize that it's your Lord's day no matter where we are, whether we be at home or, or anywhere we be. It is your Lord's day. And help us, Lord God, to remember that any event like this, and it's still going to be your Lord's day. We help us, we pray, Lord God, it continue to be with us and help all our efforts, Lord God, to continue to reach out to the world, to, to bring some light to this dark world that they may see your works and your love through us. We pray, Lord God, for the forgiveness of our sins. All these things we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Our next song is number 310. After this song, 
we'll have our Lord's Supper. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul Love and mercy found me, there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find Rest beyond the river, near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, Till I reach the golden strand Just beyond the river In the cross, in the cross Be my glory ever Till my raptured soul shall find Rest beyond the river I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat and drink the bread of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, he, uh, for he who eats and drinks and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Jesus died for our sins on that cross. And in this time of, of not being here together, let's take extra effort to put the worldly things out of our mind right now and think about a sacrifice for us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your son who died on the cross for our many sins. And... We were not worthy for that sacrifice, but we thank you so much. Lord, at this time, we thank you for this bread that represents the body that was broken on behalf of us. And please help us to put the world out of our mind right now and partake of this bread in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Will you again pray with me? Dear Lord, we come to you again thanking you so much for the, the blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. We thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents that blood. Again, please help us to take it in a manner worthy to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song is number 745, 745, Soldiers of Christ Arise. <laughs> Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power. Who in the strength of Jesus trusts? Who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror? Stand then in his great might with all his strength and dude. But take to arm you for the fight. But take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness of the soul. Take every virtue, every grace. Take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. That having all things done, and all your conflicts past, you may all come through Christ alone. You may all come through Christ alone, and stand entire at last. After our next song, we'll have our, our message. We'll be doing number 590. Number 590. This is a song that may not be familiar to a lot of folks. Uh, I just learned it yesterday, but the lyrics seem very fitting as we focus on things that we can and should do rather than all the things that we can't do. Have you lifted a stone from your brother's way as he struggled along life's road? Have you lovingly touched some frail toil-worn hand shared with someone their heavy load? All oh, the things we may do, you and I, you and I, Oh, the love we can give if we try. Just a word or a song as we're passing along. They will count in the great by and by. Have you spoken a word full of hope and cheer? Have you walked with a slower pace? Till the weary of heart who were stumbling on took new courage to run the race. 
all the things we may do, you and I, you and I, all the love we can give if we try. Just a word or a song as we're passing along, they will count in the grave by and by. Have you held up your light through the shadows dark so that somebody else might see? Have you lived with the Christ through the long, long day, gaining many a victory? All the things we may do, you and I, you and I, all the love we can give if we try. Just a word or a song as we're passing along, they will count in the great by and by. I really appreciate that song, Jamie. I hadn't heard that one before, or maybe if I had, it had been a long time, but man, those lyrics were just spot on. You know, it's a really challenging time. I was thinking humorously about a time when a friend of mine was preaching in a small mining town in Colorado, and the mine had shut down. And so the church, which had once been about 300 or 350 members, um, only had about 10, and it just so happened that nine of those 10 had decided to go on vacation when he went and preached. And so there was one lady and she had a newborn and he got up there and began his sermon and as he was preaching he knew he was getting down towards the end there and all of a sudden she got up because the baby needed to be fed and left and so he was preaching to an empty auditorium of people and so he extended out his sermon for about five minutes longer until she came back and I asked him I said well why did you extend it out he said so I could offer an invitation so <laughs> which I thought was very funny. And so if I, uh, if I am preaching and pointing at fingers here, there's only a few people in the audience right now that's right in front of me that I could be pointing at. But all joking aside, these are challenging times. And with that in mind, I can't help but seeing the irony in the fact that beginning in March, we began a Bible, uh, a series that I simply called Bible Study for Busy People. And then God took care of that, <laughs> or the coronavirus did, uh, because all of a sudden everything that was on my calendar for the foreseeable future just evaporated. And I had the things that were most important right in front of me. I had taking care of myself and focusing upward towards my God. And so I felt like it was fitting to take those remainder of those lessons that we had, and I am going to finish them because I've pretty much worked them all out in my mind what I'm going to preach. And so at 2 o'clock p.m. on Mondays, I'm going to live stream uh, from the church building here. And if I can't be at the church building, it'll be from my house. Uh, the remainder of those lessons, there's three of them on the Bible study for busy people. And so we'll spend 20 or 30 minutes. If you can't watch it at 2 o'clock, maybe you've got work, that's okay. It'll be archived. It'll be available on our Facebook page. It'll also be available on our YouTube page. And I'll see if I can get Dennis to upload it on our church's main webpage as well. But in the meantime, I felt like it was fitting, just because it's on everybody's heart and minds, uh, just to preach some sermons that deal with the challenges that are present. And this is totally unique. I, I don't think there's anybody that I've talked to that says, oh yeah, this reminds me of everybody, young and the old. And regardless of, of who I've talked to, they have admitted this is something they've never experienced in their life. That's not to say it hasn't happened to others. And as you'll see at the end of this lesson, we're going to take a look at how Churches of Christ responded in the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919. But for those that I've spoken to, for those that are members of our congregation now as our leadership met, we realize that these are unique times. And one of the things that has become very apparent to me is that this gives us an opportunity as Christians to really focus in on the main thing. You know, I, I'm, I often think about a, a phrase that was shared with me years ago, to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, in times of crisis, 
sort of the main thing is what rises to the surface. And, and how do we respond? You know, you can't go from one book of the Bible to another book of the Bible without realizing that the people that wrote the Bible, the people that were characters of the Bible, they faced challenges that were every bit as perilous as the one that we are facing today and sometimes even more so. And so we can't say that God's word doesn't speak to us as Christians when we face unique times of crisis. But I want you to think for just a couple of minutes, what is it that you have seen out in the world as you have looked around? You've seen some pretty negative reactions. If you turn on the news, if you go to the grocery stores, and of course, those are the things that gets the attention in the media. Those are the things that gets all of the information uh, published. You see the reactions of fear where people are afraid at a time like this. Or you see the reactions of denial, the opposite of being afraid. People going on about their life and like, it, like nothing is happening in the world. Like there's not this terrible virus that is wrecking entire countries and entire economies. Uh, people just act like nothing is happening. Or you might see that people are riddled with anxiety. They're uncertain about whether they're going to go to the grocery store and get bread or toilet paper or whatever it is that they might have need for. And, and just the general anxiety that comes from your life being upended. People having to work from home, children having to be at home, not being able to go to church. Just all of the usual things that are part of the rhythm of our life have been disrupted. And that causes some people to have anxiety. Or you've seen blame. You see people blaming the government for not responding fast enough or blaming the government for over responding to this particular crisis or blaming other people for not washing their hands or what have you. People begin to turn on one another and blame. And then you also have seen people just have a general sense of hopelessness. When is this going to end has been one of the most popular headlines that I've seen in the news. But you know, that's what gets all of the attention. Those negative reactions from people. But there's other things that I've seen. I've seen that in times of crisis, people and their characters also come out and, and the cream rises to the top. And so we also have seen things such as faith. People turning towards God and saying we just have to trust God and remember that God is on his throne at this time. And instead of denial, people being responsible, taking up the, the call to stay indoors, people taking up the call to watch out for their fellow man, to give a little bit extra to the food pantry, to go and donate blood when they might not otherwise think to do so. Or they've been focused. Instead of anxious, they've focused on what they need to do. To try to focus on where am I going to go to get my groceries? What can I do to help my neighbor? And so forth and so on. Or they have been unified. It's interesting to see this come about, where people that just a few weeks ago were bitter rivals uh, in a political sense or even in, in a sense of, of neighbors sort of come together in a unique time of challenge and crisis. Or instead of hopelessness, people projecting an image of hopefulness. And so you have all of these different emotions. These are different ways that people have responded. And you've probably seen in some variety or another all of these emotions displayed over the past week. And I think we can expect these to go on. People will continue to be afraid as long as this crisis is persistent. People will continue to be anxious. But people will also continue to have faith and continue to, to be responsible and do what is needed. But what I want to focus on right now is how are we as Christians supposed to respond in a time of crisis? What does the Bible say about how we should respond when things are challenging and those challenges are presented to us in our life. Well, before we get into that, I want you to think about this quote from President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And he looked back on a generation that faced tremendous challenges. He looked back on a generation of people that just went through the Second World War in which the country had to come together and work towards a common good. And something that he said really stuck out to me as I read this quote. He said, In battle they learned a great truth that there are no atheists in foxholes. They know that in time of test and trial, we instinctively turn to God for new courage. Whatever our individual church, whatever our personal creed, our common faith in God is a common bond among us. And that's what my hope is. 
My hope is that as we face this challenging time together, you know, we can't, we can't always judge ourselves based on the world. But we've got to look towards God and we've got to look towards the scriptures. And we've got to ask ourselves as a church, as Christians, what kind of people does God expect us to be in times of crisis? Well, I've got three points for you today that I want to share with you. Three ways that we should respond in a time of crisis. And the first way that we should respond in a time of crisis is in a neighborly way. We should respond in a neighborly way. I want you to open your Bible with me this morning to Luke, the 10th chapter. Go over to Luke, the 10th chapter for just a moment. Of course, in Luke, the 10th chapter, we've got one of the most famous of all Jesus' parables. But before we get to that parable, I want to remind you of the scene which sets up that parable. There's a law. You're in Luke, chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. And he's going to come to the disciples and he's going to challenge them. And he's going to, not really the disciples, he's going to come to Jesus and he's going to say to him, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus simply asked him the question, what is written in the law? And apparently the lawyer, knowing the law very well, spoke the correct answer. He says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. And so the lawyer answers correctly. These, these are sort of the, the, the basis of what God expects from his people in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. But the lawyer wishing to justify himself, I guess wishing to make himself look good, says, who is my neighbor? And that sets up the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let's continue reading, if you would, with Jesus and his words in the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the robbers. And they stripped him and beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to this place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was uh, on, on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him, and he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his beast, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And on the next day he took out, uh, took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and what, whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And the lawyer says to Jesus, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. And so when we think about this particular parable and we think about the scenario which prompted Jesus to give this parable, I think we can see three things that we can learn about being neighborly in a time of crisis. And the first thing that we can learn is to love God and love our neighbor is in, in essence what it means to be a child of God. To have that right relationship with God, to put God first in our lives, and boy don't we need him in times of crisis. Uh, and maybe that's one of the, the blessings, if you want to use that word, that comes out of this where people will actually focus on God and they'll realize that they're not in control of their lives and that God is only sovereign, no one else is, and that they'll think about the reality of their own destiny, that someday, whether it's uh, a result of this outbreak or sometime down the road, they are going to stand before God. But Jesus tells the lawyer something that I think we need to not just focus on in times of crisis, but each and every day of our lives as Christians. That loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves is, in essence, the very foundation of what it means to be a Christian. But as we turn towards that parable that Jesus gave us regarding the Good Samaritan, we see some other useful information about being neighborly. The neighborly person is the one who helps. Bottom line. The neighborly person was the one who was willing to turn towards the one who was need, in need and find a way to meet that need. 
And I think it's interesting that Jesus uses two other individuals, a priest and a Levite. These were individuals that, according to Jewish standards, would have been looked at as very godly people, having it all together. Good Christian people, if you want to put it in our modern vernacular. And yet they weren't the neighborly person in this time of crisis for the man that was in need. The one who was neighborly was the Samaritan, the one that the Jews would have thought, oh, he's not the godly person. He's not the person that has it all together. And yet Jesus says, the one who showed mercy, the one who was the neighbor by meeting the need, he was the one that truly exemplified loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And the third thing that we can learn from this about being neighborly is what it actually looks like to be neighborly. I want you to notice what the Samaritan does when he finds this man that had been beaten and left by the robbers. He doesn't just administer a small amount of aid to him and then go on his merry way. He goes above and beyond to meet his neighbor's need in this time of crisis. He takes the man and he places him upon his own animal and then the man walks alongside the animal. He takes the man and makes sure that he has secure lodging and he even takes his own money and gives it to the innkeeper and says, here's some money to cover the needs for this man while he heals up. And if there's any other expenses, if there's anything else that is needed, when I return, I will pay that as well. Well, this is exactly what it looks like to be neighborly. And I'm so thankful to be a part of the church. I've seen some demonstrations of this kind of neighborly behavior from our brethren, thinking in ways in which how we can reach out to others. And so in times of crisis, the first way that we as Christians should respond is in a neighborly way, a way that models loving God and loving our neighbor as ourself, a way that looks like that Samaritan in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. But a second way that we should respond, not just neighborly, is brotherly. We should respond brotherly. And when you think about the church, the church is often referred to as the family of God, the body of Christ. And, and I think that's one of the hardest things about this present time is we are challenged with not being together as a family. And, and, and coming together and singing songs of worship together and spending time together is something we all look forward to as members of the church. And when we can't do that, it, it presents, it's almost like a hole in our heart where we, we feel like we're missing something. And that's because we are a family. And as a family, the Bible tells us that we need to watch out for one another. And so in times of crisis, yes, we need to be neighborly towards all people, but especially we need to be brotherly towards the family of God. Let me point out some scriptures that uh, tell us this exact truth. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, and in fact the entire first section of Galatians chapter 6 is talking about meeting needs, about helping to bear one another's burdens, and so forth and so on. And in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, as Paul concludes that section, he says something that's very important to remember in times of crisis. He says, do good to all men, but especially those of the household of faith. Do good to all men, but especially those of the household of faith. One of our elders recently, just in the past week, as I was sitting around and visiting with him, made this exact point. He said, look, we need to find ways to meet folks' need, but especially our people. We have a special burden to take care of our people at this time. This isn't the only place in Scripture where this fact is mentioned. In fact, if you turn over to and think about 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, there, as Paul is giving instructions to Timothy, who was the evangelist for the church in Ephesus, he says that we must take care of our own. And if a man does not take care of his own household first, then he's worse than an unbeliever. Now, I believe that Paul specifically had in mind the uh, immediate family, where a father or a leader of a family has the responsibility to take care of his own wife and children and the, take care of his own affairs. And if he doesn't do so, then he's even worse than an unbeliever, Paul says. But I think we can expand that out to the church family. I do believe that God expects us to be brotherly in times of crisis, to think about our brethren and say, look, these are my family members. 
These are members of the body of Christ. What can I do at this time to serve them? How can I pray for them? Who can we reach out to that may be in particular need? If we continue on, we can think about the passage from John 13 and verse 34 and sort of why it is so important for us, not just in times of crisis, but especially in times of crisis, to love one another in this way. Because Jesus said in John 13, 34, that our love for one another is going to show our commitment to Jesus to the world. You know, here, here's the bottom line, church. This is our time to shine. If we can't love one another in a time of crisis, if we can't love one another in a time like this, then why would anyone want to come to the church? Sure, we can stand up and preach and tell them the words of truth, but if they don't see Jesus' love in action, then it's no surprise that the world doesn't have a very high opinion of the church. It's a time for us to step up and be a city that is set upon a hill, to be neighborly, but also to be brotherly, to show a special kind of love that we should have for one another as Jesus has commanded to us. And lastly, on this point, we can think about how the Bible gives us an example. In fact, I want you to turn in your Bible over to Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. Here we read an example of the early church, and what we see is that they were brotherly towards one another. They were invested in the lives of each other. And so it begins in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 by saying, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that they had anything belonging to him that was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Isn't that a great example of brotherly love? How the early church was just so generous and kind and willing to do whatever it takes. And, and again, I've seen some really great examples of that already as we are, are facing this present crisis. But not only are we as Christians to respond in times of crisis by being bro uh, neighborly, we're also to respond in times of crisis by being brotherly. And the last point in which we look at how we are to respond in times of crisis is we are to respond wisely. And I think there's a lot of wisdom given in Scripture that helps us to keep a calm and level head even in times of turmoil. We can't be those people that are out there fear-mongering, that are prying off of the fears of the world, that are, are just clamped down with anxiety because of what is facing us. Nor can we be those people that are going on unwisely acting like this isn't a big deal. The reality is, it is a big deal. The governments of the world are responding in ways that they are because it is taking a serious toll on the people that it has affected. And so we can't have those extreme opinions to be completely shuddered with fear or to have no sense at all and no wisdom at all in how we respond to this. Rather, the Bible in both the Old Testament, specifically I'm thinking of the wisdom literature, and in the New Testament encourages Christians to be wise. And in times of crisis, we certainly need to be people that look to as being full of wisdom and are responding wisely to the crisis that is at hand. I want you to think about this particular passage that comes from the book of Matthew. As Jesus was sending his servants out to do ministry, he said something to them that I think is very applicable, especially in times of crisis. He says, I want you to be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. In other words, be wise. Be full of godly wisdom. Avoid those extreme reactions. Be shrewd in how you respond to the situation, yet be innocent as doves and be godly in how you respond. In fact, if you go over to Luke chapter 18, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 16 and verse 8, it's speaking in that instance about the parable of the unrighteous steward. And his master is going to call him into account for his debt that he has owed. And the unrighteous steward in Luke chapter 16 goes around to the other people that, it, that owe his master a debt. And he gets them to pay, some uh, pay the money back. And the Bible praises this unrighteous steward 
because he acted shrewdly. He acted wisely. And if you go back to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 7 and verse 24, that word that is used and translated wise, when Jesus was talking about the two foundations, the wise man who built his house upon the rock and the foolish man who built his house upon the sand, is a very similar word. In fact, it comes from a word that is, has the same root as that word shrewd. And so when we're using the word shrewd, we're talking about the idea of wise. One who discerns the time. One who understands how they need to respond. One who avoids the extremes in responding. And so it is the wise person who discerns the times and responds appropriately. And that is how God calls us to respond as Christians in times such as this. To respond wisely. And so we are called to be wise stewards of the time and the resources that God has given to us. When we think about our money, when we think about our time, when we think about our earthly possessions, a time of crisis is a time which pulls our focus sharply on those things. It causes us to think about, in a way that we might not otherwise, how am I spending my money? How am I spending my time? What priorities are really important that I should be giving attention to at this time? You know, whenever things are, are hunky-dory and, and money is plentiful and time is, is ours to use however we want, we might not think about it this way. But in a time of crisis, it's very important for us to act shrewdly, for us to act wisely as the Bible calls us to. So there are three ways that I want to put forward to you this morning that Christians need to respond in a time of crisis such as this. Number one, we need to respond neighborly. That is to say, we need to look out for our fellow man. And we need to be willing to take our shirt off our back, as the old adage goes, if we need to, to help our fellow man. But first and foremost, we must be willing to act brotherly, to respond in a brotherly way. Because after all, if we can't take care of our own house, are we really reflecting the kind of love that Jesus wants us to reflect as his people? And thirdly, we need to act wisely. We need to avoid the extreme reactions that we see in the world, and we need to act with a level head. And if we allow the scriptures, they will give us that kind of wisdom if we'll study them. I want to close by referring to the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919. Just because you and I may not have faced something like this in our lifetime doesn't mean that it hasn't, even in modern history, had something just as serious that uh, has happened. And that was true of the Spanish flu epidemic, which killed tens of millions of people around the world. And in the United States alone, some 700,000 people died during the Spanish flu epidemic. This past week, the Christian Chronicle, which is a brotherhood news publication, published an article looking at how members of Churches of Christ responded during the Spanish flu epidemic. This article that was written by John Hicks kind of looked into the Brotherhood publications and said, how did people respond then? And I think if we look back at it, we can learn so that we can act appropriately just as many of them did. In fact, I'm going to bring up some quotes from that article on the PowerPoint. The, the influenza epidemic, as A.B. Lipscomb wrote in the Gospel Advocate, had opened up a way for the enlargement of the sympathies of the Christian people. And again, this goes along with what we're talking about today. It's an opportunity for us to shine our light, for us to be the Christian example, for us to respond in the Christ-like way that Jesus would want us to respond. And A.B. Lipscomb evidently saw the Spanish flu epidemic as an opportunity for the church to love people in the way that God would want them to. Ben West, who lived in Ennis, Texas, informed the Gospel Advocate that Sunday was the first day for 12 years that I have failed to attend service. And then he added, we had three funerals here on Sunday. Though the church was not assembling, they were busy attending to the sick. And I found that article, or rather that quote, very striking. I know one of the things that people initially struggled with is, what are we going to do regarding worship of services? Are we going to meet? Are we going to have sort of a divided assembly where people can meet? But then we start to realize that the needs, the pressing needs, dictate what we do. And we start responding appropriately. 
And so while we would want to gather together, just as this brother did back in the Spanish flu epidemic, we realized that there are these pressing needs of safety. And what would God want us to do? What does love your neighbor as yourself look like in a time like this? Sure, we would all like to assemble, but is that in, in, in the best interest of our neighbors in times like this? And so I found that a very interesting quote as I studied through that article this week. Two more quotes from that particular article. M.C. Curfees, who was a leader, uh, a very well-known leader in the church at that time, said, It behooves us, he wrote, to cheerfully submit to this order, that is the government order, and to exert all our energies in an earnest and sympathetic effort to cooperate with the benevolent purpose of our government to check the deplorable disease. And I think that's wise. Again, that goes back to that third point in the sermon this morning. There's some wisdom in those words, and we need to think about those words as well. And lastly, though churches suspended their large assemblies, they did not cease to worship. Rather, as E.D. Shelton in Fayette City, Pennsylvania wrote, we worshiped God from house to house. And I know that it's already been mentioned this morning, but we've got to remind ourselves that even though we might not be in this building where I am this morning, it's still the Lord's Day. And if you're gathering with us and you're joining us on our live stream, then you are with us in spirit and you're assembling and honoring the Lord's Day. Brethren, these are challenging times. These are times of crisis, but we got to remember the scriptures. We've got to remember what the scriptures tell us to do and how they present us wisdom that needs to be applied. And I do believe this is a time for us to rise up as Christian people and for the best of us to come out. The world needs us to be serving. The world needs an example of brotherly love. The world needs us to be labor, neighborly at a time like this. I'd like to ask you, if you would, please, as we conclude this lesson this morning, to bow your head in a word of prayer as we pray about these things. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us albeit challenged, to gather together and to worship in your name. Father, we are scattered as the flock. We are in house to house, and we aren't able to meet together at this time. And we know, Father, that you knew these things would happen. And we can learn from the scriptures and the precedent set therein how we can respond as your people. And we just pray and ask God that you'll help us to be neighborly, to love our neighbor as ourself, and to look out and meet those pressing needs of the people that are around us as we can, Lord. And Father, we pray that you'll help us to be brotherly, to look to our church family and to see how we can especially meet their needs and we can serve them at a challenging time like this. And Father, help us to have wisdom and help us to act wisely and help us, Father, to respond to this current crisis in a way that pleases you in a way that is filled with godly wisdom and insight. And Father, we do pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are riddled with fear. And we also pray for those who aren't fearful enough. We pray, God, that their hearts and minds will uh, turn to you and they will think about uh, the fact that you are on your throne. Father, we pray for revival, that something like this will help people's hearts to turn back to you. And we pray and ask God that we can all learn and grow from this challenge. We know, Father, that nothing can remove us from your hand, not even death itself, if we continue to walk steadfast in Christ's love and walk in fellowship with him and with one another. And we just pray, Father, that you will be with us during this present challenge. Give our leaders especially wisdom and insight as they face the challenges of how to keep the work of the church going in such a challenging time. And be with all of those who are, are, whose lives have been made difficult from this virus. Be with those who are facing loss of jobs. Be with our young people who are facing uh, time away from their school and friends, especially our high school seniors, Lord, and those who are in college who may be missing out on once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. For those who have had very important events, weddings and such planned that have been totally disrupted by this, we know that on the surface, these things all may seem very trivial, Father, but it creates within us a sense of uncertainty and anxiety. And we just pray, God, that you'll be with all of those who have been affected in unique ways by this particular virus. And Lord, again, we thank you for this opportunity that it's been made present to us, that we could live stream this service. 
Thank you for the modern technology that you've given us that have allowed us uh, an opportunity to uh, present this service in this way. Be with us in this coming week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to turn it over to Jamie Jacobs, who is going to lead us in one final song, and then Noah Green will close us out in a closing prayer. <clears throat> Sing number 655, Instruments of Your Peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Where there is hatred, we will sow his love. Where there is injury, we will never judge. Where there is striving, we will speak his peace to the people crying for release. We will be his instruments of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Where there is blindness, we will pray for sight. Where there is darkness, we will shine his light. Where there is sadness, we will bear their grief to the millions crying for release. We will be his instruments of peace. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We thank you that we have the opportunity to be able to worship you, even if it is from afar and with these technologies. And we pray that everything we do, all the worship and all the works that we do in this troubling time will be pleasing to you. We pray that as we learn to rely on technology for worship service and other things for the things that we are struggling with at this time, that we can learn that we can rely on you for our life. We can rely on you for everything that we need. We pray that we always remember that. We pray that we can be praising you and we can use this time as an opportunity to do your goodwill. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.